So good afternoon. Um, I'm Major Juliana Rodriguez. This is Captain Christopher Rapsi. If you didn't see us this morning, uh, one of the things that uh, somebody was kind enough to tweet was that we did a live demo, so we had a lot of courage. Uh, we were just discussing <laughs> if the slides continued not to work, we'll just go without slides and talk to you. So hopefully, uh, for those of you who are more visually oriented, the fact that the slides are now working is a benefit. Um, we're going to talk through a little bit of what we said this morning, uh, but we're going to go into a little bit more depth on some of the things that, that we approached, how, our, how we were able to uh, do this, and maybe if we get some time, a little bit about how we've structured it. And it's open, uh, so you can take a look at our, our solution online uh, for being able to provide this. So Army Cyber School, what is it, right? So we, I, I mentioned that we started a couple years ago. I think we weren't even official until like, October of 2015, so we're not even quite two years old officially. Uh, we do have a fairly significant student load, um, and with that, we're going to be training two standards that we don't create, because in the military, we are given the standards, and we have to make sure that as a training organization, we meet those standards. In this case, we're meeting the US Cybercom joint standards, uh, so the same standards that the Air Force, the Navy, the Coast Guard, um, Marines, same standards as they all have, uh, and we train to those. We additionally answer to our second boss of standards of the Army, and what is it that we need to train from an Army skill perspective, as well as what, are it, what is it that the Army thinks needs to be trained inside of cyber as the, the, as the branch. Our outcomes, though, uh, what I explained this morning really briefly was that Instead of just approaching it from, okay, I have a checklist, I'm just gonna go down this checklist and, and have something for each thing on the checklist. Yes, we wanna make sure that we've covered all of those standards, but we don't wanna do it from a, a perspective of checking boxes. We wanna do it from a perspective of what are the students actually going to be able to do with those skills and standards after we've taught them. So that's why we started looking at being able to do a more agile development process so that we enable instructors to create the content that allows us to, uh, if we want um, a great idea for, let's say, let's put malware on one virtual machine and let's have another virtual machine be able to identify what the problems with that one virtual machine are, right? Uh, that might take a while, um, but if we want to be able to get to the, the type of problem solving that our outcomes are for students, uh, then we have to enable our instructors to do that. So what I was explaining this morning, the legacy courseware of doing that was that you would write those requirements down. So yeah, I want this type of VM uh, to have this type of malware on it, and I want this other type of VM configured in this way, and I want a network that looks like this uh, that will enable them to see each other. So we would write that down, and we would give that to hopefully an existing contract or some type of organization that would provide us with that back. And the problem with that was even in the very, very, very best scenario, it was still taking about a week to see something back. And that was with a surge level of contract support that was, I think, like about 10 times what we would normally expect to see uh, for if we were even a priority still. So that was not gonna work for this, this model that we wanted to create for how we get after those student outcomes. So instead, if we approach this as Everything, courseware, infrastructure, everything is code. Then when the instructor gets an idea, in my example, then they would go into GitHub, they would write a heat template for, for that scenario that I described, and they would suggest it up. They would, they would push it forward, uh, and then in 12 to 18 hours, they would be able to run that content for their students. So it's a massive efficiency gain in time. Um, it's also a gain in cost because, like I was saying, at a surge level, we had about three dedicated engineers trying to answer our requirements, but you have the communication, miscommunications. Uh, this avoids all of that because the instructor who had the idea writes it themselves, submits it forward, and then they're able to see the benefits in their classes immediately. 
Okay, so Captain Krasapsi, you're from this morning. Hi. Uh, so Major Rodriguez mentioned the GitHub flow and everything is code. Uh, so we've gone a bit beyond just doing infrastructure as code and courseware as code. We have applied the GitHub flow to everything that we do. Uh, so we have a change management board. We don't do that anymore. We don't have people sitting around or sending each other emails saying, hey, I'm going to do this change. Do you approve it? Yes or no? No. All that is done via the GitHub flow in version control, right? Everything is done in Git. Uh, makes it super simple, really easy to track changes over time, uh, really easy to hold people accountable for things they do or do not do, which is a huge boon for us. Um, what used to take months, years, as we said previously, takes minutes and hours. Uh, it's a massive change from the way business is normally done. Uh, who here is familiar with GitHub Flow? Who here writes software for a living? Yeah, right, you guys know exactly what I'm talking about, right? It's a total, it's an awesome way to do work, especially collaboratively across different organizations and time zones, all kinds of great stuff. It's a huge change. Um, for those of you that don't know the GitHub flow, basically it works like this. There's one master branch, and from that, from that branch, all code is deployable. It's all considered production ready, ready to go. Uh, when someone wants to make a, a change or make a suggestion or fix a bug or add a feature, they'll make their own branch called, you know, whatever, whatever it's called. They'll do their commits or commit. Uh, they'll do a pull request if you're in GitHub, but we use GitLab internally, so we do a merge request. Um, the rest of the team that's part of that effort will then comment on what they're doing, say, hey, I think you should do this differently. Hey, this objective for this lesson should be changed. The wording should change a little bit based on you know, whatever guidance and standards they feel like they're implementing. Uh, once the team as a whole comes to a consensus, the course manager says, hey, yep, this uh, merge request is good to go. I approve, and now part of master. And so students will see that the very next day, potentially. Uh, that's a big change from how we've done things in the past. All right, so the, the thing that makes it all work is this system of systems called Broadband Handrail. Um, it is our infrastructure as a service platform. It is our uh, GitLab. It's our CI pipeline. It's everything that makes it all work together. Um, we use OpenStack for infrastructure as a service, obviously. We use GitLab for, uh, config for uh, version control. Uh, we use SaltStack for automation and config management. Um, and we apply DevOps concepts to everything that we do. Uh, the neat thing about the system is that it allows people who have already left the schoolhouse gone on to their, you know, gaining units to do whatever mission that they have, is they can reach back and see, hey, what is the latest and greatest course content the schoolhouse is putting out so they can stay current with whatever they have to stay current with on mission. Uh, how it used to be is once you left the schoolhouse, that was it. Like, you would have professional development be three to five years later, you go back to school, you get the latest and greatest stuff, and then you leave again. Three to five more years, you go back, get it updated again. This lets the force constantly see what's going on and constantly stay abreast of new developments, uh, which is a great change and an important change and something we were very proud of. Okay, so like everything else, uh, you gotta start somewhere, right? So it's really difficult to buy things in the federal government, very, very difficult. Um, so we found some servers, 40 cores total, right? And it was like, all right, well, we're just gonna stick them in the classroom, slap them on a desk. We didn't have any cooling or racks or anything like that. Uh, so we slapped them on a desk, it was okay. We gotta connect these all laptops. So we ran cables through the drop ceiling, because that's just how we had to do it. It's the way it is. Um, we had Wi-Fi hotspot uh, as our internet access point to support this environment. Uh, we had a squid server sitting between that to kind of cache Debian packages and whatnot where else we needed to make it not make it somewhat bearable. Um, and that's what we ran for a good probably six months or so. Uh, and it worked for the most part, right? And this was only a year <laughs> <Yeah>. ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this yeah. was last year. Yeah. So, uh, so and it, it worked, right? So that showed our leadership that, hey, this concept, it, it is workable and it's doable and we should probably invest more time and money. Uh, so go through all the long and laborious government processes we have to do to buy things. We did it uh, and we've moved forward from there. Before we got to that, we learned a couple things. We found some challenges. Uh, three big challenges from our perspective are people, processes, and technology. Uh, so he, who here is from a, an organization that has maybe 10,000 or more employees or personnel? Right, okay. So from my perspective, there's three kinds of people in a large organization. There's the obstructionist, there's the incompetent person, and then there's the helpful person, right? And so depending where you're at, you're gonna run into these different kinds of people. The obstructionist is concerned about furthering their own existence. They're not necessarily concerned with the mission of the organization, they're concerned with you know, being the bulwark against whatever evil thing you're trying to do, right? Those people are prevalent throughout and all large is organizations. Evil. Yeah, right, change is bad, Always. right? Those, those kinds of people, that's what we're talking about. Uh, incompetent people. So sometimes people just get in a job, they maybe don't necessarily belong there, but they're really difficult to get rid of for one reason or another. And those people just stay there forever, 
right? There's people like that all over the place across all kinds of organizations. And then the third kind of person are helpful people, people that genuinely want to do the right thing, people that have the best interests of the organization in mind. Those are the people we've encountered. And so working with those three different dynamics has been really challenging for us because depending who you talk to, if we go to the IA team, for example, we say, hey, we want to do this thing, we want to make it so that we can make changes on the fly. Do you think the IA team was all about that? No, they were not. They did not understand fundamentally what we were trying to accomplish. Uh, and so working through that was really challenging. Um, processes. So I mentioned earlier, briefly, that buying things is difficult. So to buy one server, even just calling something a server, takes about one year. One year to buy one server. It's insane. But again, that's the way things are. So we have to work through that. So what we did was we said, all right, rather than doing this you know, once every three months, every time we need to expand, just buy a whole bunch of stuff right now and just we'll run with it for the next five years. And that's what we did. Um, so we bought a large environment, about four petabits of storage, a couple thousand cores, 36 terabytes of RAM. We kind of ran with that. And that's what we have right now. Um, technology. So the government isn't generally known for being on the leading edge of technology. Uh, MPLS is like the new cool guy thing inside the federal government. It came out in like 2001, it was the first RFC, right? So that's kind of what we're talking about. Um, so to tell people that, hey, we're getting people into private cloud inside the DoD and this thing called OpenStack, free and open source. Free and open source still scares people to an extent in some places, right? That's a, that's a scary thing. Take it leave it, that's just the way it is inside the, inside the government, right? So we said, we're going to do this free and open source, private cloud, and we're just going to go after it. Um, that scared a lot of people. But again, we got it accomplished. One, one thing I wanted to point out with that, the reason we chose this graphic is because according to the internal folks inside of uh, DOD, uh, the progress that we made in a year is breakneck speed. So that slug thinks it's going really, really fast and is like, oh, we got to maybe ease back a little. Maybe we need to relook this approval that we think we might have given you incorrectly. Uh, as opposed to, you know, if you're seeing the slug, you realize the slug's not making that much progress very fast. So uh, the, the encouragement to you all would be if you believe in a vision for change, if you can continue to find ways to communicate that and assess the risks and show the decision makers why these risks are more acceptable for your organization's goals in the long term than these risks of not changing, Right? I think a big thing that I've heard of the past year is change your die, um, then that's going to enable you to continue on even if that pace may not be very fast to what you want. So lessons learned. Uh, the first one, um, it's actually something, something that uh, from an army planning perspective, sometimes this happens. You'll have one organization given a mission and they'll do an awesome job at that and you have another organization giving them a separate mission, and they'll do an awesome job at that. So they're both being excellent, but if they don't come together, then potentially the strategic goals that you have for a mission or a campaign are not gonna be met. Uh, similarly here, if we're having teams that are doing awesome things in one course, or awesome things developing the infrastructure, and they're not on the same path together, we're not gonna to get to where we need to be as an organization. So it's a constant process of trying to figure out who else needs to have a conversation about vision, uh, where we're going, do they have concerns, can we meet their concerns, how do we make sure we're headed there together. Uh, so it's much like in an open source community where you have to identify where is it that you're going uh, and get a lot of different stakeholders to kind of share that vision so that you can go forward in a, in a unified direction. Uh, second lesson learned is the version control. So Capnapsy mentioned that we wanted to be able to identify who's, who's contributing, um, both from a perspective of can we, can we en encourage their efforts, do they need additional support, um, as well as then uh, potentially from a learning perspective, have they committed something or suggested a commit that now we need to go back in and do some retraining. Uh, so, the version control allows both that learning process as well as the process for uh, being able to roll things back if they didn't work out correctly. And everything as code lets you very clearly see those changes as opposed to the way that uh, the government often does things with PowerPoint documents and Excel documents and you don't know 
which version was which, if they start to diverge, it's really hard to pull them back together. Our third lesson learned was, uh, put a kind of a more military term here, understanding the domain. So when we talk about domains in the military, we're talking about land, air, sea, space, and cyberspace, right? So that's our fifth domain. Um, to be able to identify how to operate in a domain, you have to understand that domain. And we looked at this in two aspects, right? So uh, to, to talk about the domain here is in the cyberspace domain, that's anything um, digital logic, right? So anything that touches digital logic or anything that runs digital logic. And being able to do our job in cyberspace uh, means that we're able to either modify the way that things work from a cyber warfare perspective, or we're able to make sure that others don't modify them against us from a defense perspective on warfare. So, so that's what I mean by domain. Uh, if we have folks who are developing and they don't understand the domain, like let's say we have somebody who's got an awesome resume, they come in, they're like, I'm gonna do this, and, and the things that we talk about at a really high level of abstraction sound great, but they don't take the time to understand the system that exists. So if they don't understand the system that exists and they start developing, and maybe they're spending a lot of time on that development, but they don't actually understand where it fits into what's being developed and they don't understand what is already, um, that's not gonna work, right? Uh, and, and similarly, from a leadership perspective, how do you ensure that leaders are able to drive change? So a leader that doesn't understand the domain in which they operate is probably going to be able to maintain status quo, uh, get some advice from people, maybe make a little bit of effort towards a progress, but they're not going to understand what would be the meaningful change that needs to be made because they're always going to be reliant upon someone else telling them whether that's the way it works or not. But if they don't have that understanding of the domain, uh, in this case, what is digital logic, how does that work, right? Uh, then they can't drive the change that they need to drive. Okay, so where we're at now, we have actual like standardized racks in an actual data center that has you know a drop floor and like air conditioning. <laughs> it's, it, yes, so it, it's, a, it's a server room. Uh, it's right, so the DoD can't make new data centers anymore because they're trying to consolidate everything, so it's a server room. That's a good point, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yep, so like I said before, we have about 2,000 cores, uh, four petabytes of raw storage, 36 terabytes of RAM, and a one gig dedicated internet connection uh, that serves both uh, tenants on Fort Gordon as well as you know, the remote tenants we mentioned earlier. Um, now, I also mentioned we use salt stack for config management. We actually manage the life cycle of the hardware from first powering it on all the way to decommissioning via salt stack, right? So no one's ever SSHing into servers to change a configuration file. No one's ever even allowed to do that. It's not even really possible. You have to really try really hard to get in. Um, everything is done via the salt masters that we have uh, running. It's actually really helpful, and we'll do a quick look at some of that code uh, later on today. Um, it, it was a big change going from having teams of dedicated ops people who just sit there and just configure VMs for you when you ask for them to having the instructors themselves do all this work on their own. Um, and there were some growing pains, don't get me wrong, right? So, so to change something that's been one way for you know, decades and just not do that anymore one day, that's a huge deal for a lot of people, right? So the people have been inside the DoD for many, many, many years, and to tell them that, hey, the way you've done it up to this point, that's not so great, and we're just gonna do it this other way that's totally different and foreign to you, there's a lot of heartburn there, right? Naturally, it's, it's to be expected. Um, but we have a really great team, and we've made a lot of progress kind of showing people that, hey, this is probably the better way to do it. Okay, so I mentioned that we're gonna show you some of our code. So first, if I could type in my own password correctly, that'd be good. There we go, okay. So, um, let me zoom in. All right, so I mentioned earlier today that all of our stuff is available online. Um, so we run GitLab, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, so if you want to pull down our entire infrastructure environment, yeah, here's the URL. Git.cybbh.space. You can go there, look at all of our stuff, uh, take it, reuse it, whatever. It's open source. Um, so we put everything in version control. Uh, our secrets, like the, the 
default domain admin password for OpenStack, that's inversion control. Uh, it's RSA 2048 encrypted, but it's there. Um, if you want to factor the number, I guess by all means, go ahead. Um, we keep our user account data in version control. We keep uh, API keys in version control. Everything that could possibly needed to run this environment to make it from scratch again is all stored in version control. Uh, so if the server room got hit by a meteor and we had new hardware, we could respin the whole environment to be back exactly where we are today in about two hours or so. Um, we designed it that way because we knew that, hey, we don't have a lot of time or staff to manage a whole fleet of pets that are you know, constantly having configuration drift and all kinds of other stuff. Um, so by storing it all in version control and having it all managed via salt makes things a lot easier on us. Let's have a really small, really agile team. Um, <clears throat> the way it's basically designed is that we broke it up into a couple different areas. Um, so apps, they're what they sound like. So we, can, we consider OpenStack an app. And so inside that app, we have all the states that makes OpenStack work. Uh, we consider Ceph an app. So inside the Ceph folder, we have all the states that make Ceph work. Um, we consider each stage of deployment. There's four stages for us. There's pre-provisioning, which is installing the operating system. There's provisioning, which is OS installed. And also you've got, you know, uh, RAID arrays configured. You've got, you know, extraneous NIC drivers. Like we use uh, solar fill and NICs with the open onload. Those are all configured in the uh, provision stage. After that, we install the actual apps that make it do what it's supposed to do. So at that point, we have, like, say, you know, Ceph Common installed. We've got Cinder installed. We've got other stuff that server's supposed to do. That's installed. And the final stage, when we go to production, is when those things are configured appropriately. Um, so at, versus having the very default, you know, Nova configuration, we've got Nova configured in the way we want it with all the, you know, the Ceph keys to access the RBD backend, all those things like that. Um, I'll show you what I mean. Let's take a quick look at a compute node. Right, so this is our initial provisioning state. A uh, couple basic things that everyone gets. We set uh, a default root SSH uh, public key uh, that's stored in case of emergency if we actually need it. Uh, we install open onload, like I mentioned before. Um, we configure the network card, and then that's it. That's all we do. Moving forward. Here, you can see, like I mentioned earlier, we install uh, OpenStack client and all of our different clients, because there's certain times where we need to run OpenStack commands via the nodes themselves, because we want to try and uh, minimize the footprint on which our, on which our secrets uh, exist. So every OpenStack service has its own master password. So Nova only knows about the Nova passwords. Cinder only knows about the Cinder passwords. And so by installing the client and all these different nodes, we can kind of keep that segmented really easily. We also install Ceph Common, obviously, Neutron Compute. Uh, so we currently use Linux Bridge because it's quick and simple. We didn't have a whole lot of time to implement something more robust. But in the future, we do plan on moving to uh, Open Contrail as, an, as a, a Neutron backend, which we hear works quite well. So we're looking forward to that. And finally, here's all the configuration information. Uh, we push down you know, the updated Neutron configuration. We say, hey, we sign an interface to the provider network. We apply our Ceph uh, keys that let us access the RBD backends for volumes and ephemeral storage. I'll do all the things that you, know, you need to do before you go full production. Um, really, that's in a nutshell how our system works. Uh, we do this for not only the compute nodes, we do it for the storage nodes, the Ceph nodes. We do it for the controllers. And then we do the same thing for all the, uh, the VMs that we run. So we don't run uh, the controller nodes on bare metal. We actually create a KVM VM that runs just Keystone, like just Neutron or just Nova. Uh, we kind of treat them like containers. Now, they aren't containers, but we treat them in the same way. So we need to redeploy. We don't actually change the config. We just kill the old one, just make a new one in its place, and then update HF proxy as appropriate. Um, that's kind of how we approach the whole thing. And again, if you want to look more in depth, you can take all the code by all means. Um, that was really that all we planned on kind of presenting to you guys. But of course, we're open to questions, comments, concerns, anything you guys have for us. Sir. So at the very beginning, uh, we used Marantis OpenStack uh, because we need something to work really, really quickly, and that worked great really, really quickly. Um, but as we got more and more hardware, we kind of determined that applying MOS, particularly the version we were running at the time, across this rather large uh, hardware footprint wasn't going to work in the way we wanted it to. So now we actually live completely upstream. There's no vendor or anything. We just kind of pull the packages down, install them, and just go from there. Answer your question? Thank you. Sure. Yeah. 
Yes. Right? So, so, so they're going to do both, right? So at the end of the day, so you guys have heard uh, every Marine and Rifleman, so the same concept applies to the Army. So everyone goes through basic combat training. Everyone, everyone, everyone that wears the uniform is authorized to wage war on foreign soil, right? That's just the way it is. Everybody, regardless of what your actual MOS is, at the very end of the day, you're still a soldier. You still are able to shoot rifles, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now that said, are those soldiers that are experts or technical experts, are they best employed as riflemen? No, of course not. Um, so while they are able to shoot rifles and do all those cool guy soldier things, their primary mission is to do cyber stuff. Does that make sense? Yes. Maybe you want to take that one? Yes, absolutely. So that's actually going to go back to, to here. So one of the things that we want to do is absolutely allow other folks to suggest things that would be helpful. Uh, so it, we're not, uh, this opens up the opportunity for folks who used to work here or work at the school or folks who never worked at the school, uh, but have a lot of expertise in a subject that we're teaching to be able to pull a version of what we have currently as courseware, uh, to be able to create additional suggested content or changes, deletions, additions, and then push that back up. So that's going to have to be reviewed um, and discussed among the current uh, course management team for whatever course that is before it would then be merged into the master. Can you switch back to me, to my screen, please? Cool. All right, so uh, if you guys haven't seen GitLab at all, so this is a, a change that was made like a day ago. Um, and one of our instructors said, hey, I'm gonna add these two lines into this uh, Python script, um, or correction, the C script, or C code, um, to, in order to do something. Um, so the green is what they added, the red is what they deleted. And so before that code gets committed to master, the team looks at it and says, hey, yep, this is good to go. They approve it and that's it. It makes it really, really easy to track changes over time. Yes. So, <laughs> sir, sir, who do you work for? <laughs> Sure, so are you, are you talking about the CIA project? So is it C2S, is that what it's called? GovCloud, Go sure. So <clears throat> because we wanted to provide students a consistent uh, experience at a predictable cost, offering them 24, 7, 365 unlimited access like we do right now with our internal, internal private cloud wasn't economically feasible. It was tough to predict that cost over time. Um, that said, we do want to be able to burst to GCE, to EC2, to Azure, we have uh, un unexpected workloads. Like we have large joint exercises where our you know, on-prem stuff doesn't make sense, but we want to be able to move that excess temporary workload to seamlessly EC2, Azure, GCE, and whatnot. Um, so public cloud does have a place in our environment, just not quite there yet. <laughs> oh, oh, you can't hear? Okay, gotcha. Sure, so, uh, so folks, if you have any more questions, please come to the microphone because we're trying to record the questions as well. Um, so the last gentleman's question was, hey, Amazon has this great cloud for the government. Why didn't you guys use it? It works for Amazon. Um, and <laughs> yeah, and so in the answer is, so there's a place for Amazon where it's not quite there yet. Sir? I have a question regarding um, your network security. What sort of... Um, help or hindrance or uh, with, you know, those three types of people. Yeah. Your network operations and network security people w uh, in which uh, yeah. your private network has to reside or your private cloud has to reside. Uh, can you give me uh, your experience with dealing with that community? Sure, so the traditional IA staff when inside the DoD is very much focused on security controls, right? Like we all are, NIST RMF, everyone's familiar with it, more or less you at least heard of it. Um, and so, IA people typically are not technical experts. Uh, and so when you try and explain to them that your controls are purely technical and there's not a whole lot of policy and process wrapped around them like there is usually, uh, that's a tough thing for them to swallow. Um, 
what we have found is that bringing them into the loop and kind of helping them learn more about your environment, what makes it different and why it's just as secure as the traditional you know, mainframe environment that has like a team of CNDS, uh, computer network defense people, um, that goes a long way. Kind of showing that, that one, that you care about what they're trying to do and that you're not just blowing them off, that helps out a lot, absolutely. Hi, um, SaltStack doesn't seem to quite have the same mind share in the uh, OpenStack community that say Ansible or Puppet or something. So what led you down that path? Sure. Uh, so SaltStack, so I'm a Python guy, first of all, right? So that kind of rules out Chef and, and Puppet almost immediately. Um, so that really is with Ansible and Salt. Um, and so I looked at both. And yes, it was an arbitrary decision by me. Um, but <laughs> so, so while the mindshare was there, I felt that at the time, uh, Salt had a more compelling feature set. Was it more complicated? Yes, absolutely. Um, but it had features beyond what I found available in Ansible at that time. From a tooling perspective on this uh, infrastructure, do you have any kind of sandbox where there's uh, penetration testing tools, whether it's Metasploit or some other kind of uh, tooling that people can use in that? Uh, environment? Yeah, absolutely. So I think I can pull this up real quick. So within here are a couple, let's see. We've got some old templates where we actually installed uh, via heat template things like Metasploit. So Metasploit has a deployable shell script where you can kind of inject that as the user data when we make an instance and it would kind of install automatically. Let me see if I can find it really quickly here. Uh, no, all right, so anyway, so yes. So the answer to your question is yes. So we, we deploy all those tools, not as kind of golden images and then save them forever, we make them automated, uh, you know, right from Bootstrap. Yeah, another salt stick question. Uh, mm -hmm. Are you using the upstream uh, formulas uh, or the ones that are part of the salt project or basically uh, writing your own? We rolled our own everything, yeah. <laughs> and it's available. <laughs> uh, first of all, congrats on your success so far. It looks like you've gotten past the bureaucracy very effectively. Um, I'm curious, have other aspects of Cyber Command been interested in the work that you've done so far as far as uh, collaborative um, projects even outside of the Cyber Center of Excellence? Sure, so there is a large effort underway to build what's called the PCTE, the Persistent Cyber Training Environment. And that's a DOD-wide project that provides all services with uh, kind of the same kind of thing we've done here. That is a multi-year project. I don't even think it's designed to have the first iteration available till FY20, I think somewhere around, somewhere around there. Um, so yeah, so we, we talk with them all the time about, hey, what are your plans? Here's what we're doing. Uh, they can borrow bits from us or not, it's up to them. Uh, but we absolutely, we make sure that everyone knows, hey, we've done some of this work already. If you wanna take it, by all means take it. We, so we one, of the, one of the big aspects of that also is that we are not PCTE and we are focused on individual soldier skills. So we're training individual skills. That's the purpose of what we created, uh, our system of systems. And a lot of those other collective efforts that have already gotten uh, funding and, and have groups of folks focused on it, uh, they're focused on immediately providing collective training. Now, what's the difference? Uh, really, the difference is in the bureaucracy involved with it. Uh, so there hasn't been a whole lot of focus on dictating what is required for the individual training skills. Um, and we've actually uh, talked with a couple other services whom I won't name, uh, but our ability to provide this and scale it out easily uh, is Put it, given us a bit of a, a edge in being able to provide the needs of the joint community um, versus other other solutions. Uh, Ian is a frequent uh, participant in the OpenStack summits. Uh, is there like an OpenStack, or like, excuse me, a meetup that you all of the defense organizations attend to uh, exchange? But more realistically, have you have you collaborated with other? Uh, defense organizations or national security organizations. I'll take that. Okay, so uh, we haven't coordinated directly with NSA. So our infrastructure is completely unclassified for public release, obviously, because we're releasing it publicly. Um, whereas most other IC organizations are not that way. 
Um, and so to collaborate their classified code with us is just kind of, it's a thing. Um, so they're aware of what we're doing. We, we talk to them on some basis. There's no direct code sharing. That answers your question. Uh, and you, you repeatedly mentioned GitHub. Are you using public GitHub or GitHub Enterprise? So we're using GitLab for right now, which is open source, it implements Git, open source thing, separate project. Um, but we do plan on mirroring to GitHub uh, at some point in the future, but we're just not quite there yet. Thank you. Thank you. Can you talk a little bit about your documentation, how you go from having the idea and putting it into something that's going to become a, a manual of some form to a published thing and the lifecycle management of that? Sure. Uh, you talking about course content or infrastructure? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, so as far as course content goes, so we, we follow Bloom's taxonomy, which kind of defines what objectives in a class should be like. Uh, and then we take those and then we assign them to instructors or course managers and say, hey, I need an exercise that you know, addresses this particular objective. And they go in and make that and they try and apply it back to master and then we improve it and then we inject it like that, ingest it like that. Uh, as far as architecture goes, it de so most of what we did was based on available business best practices. So I looked at white papers from you know, Red Hat and Supermicro and Marantis and Juniper and I said, hey, here's what all these guys did. Uh, here's at the scale that worked at and kind of apply those to how we made our own environment. Okay, have we reached a culmination point in questions? Other questions? Okay, so if we switch back to the other computer, so get that Psi BVH, right, broadband handrail, so Psi Side BBH space. Um, that's available publicly and has some open repositories there. The cyberschool.army.mil, you're going to have to have a uh, DOD certificate to log on to that, but if you do, that has a lot of information about the school, um, points of contact. Uh, and then if you have any questions specifically for Captain Napsy or myself, then our uh, emails are at the bottom of this slide. So. We've appreciated your, your uh, attention. Uh, we hope we've answered your questions. If you have additional questions, uh, if you just find us or email us, we'd be happy to answer them. Um, we're happy to be part of the OpenStack community. Thank you.